Hi, welcome to another edition of Easy Theory. So today is going to be a slightly different video from usual. I got a comment um, the, the day before this is being recorded that um, it might be a good idea for me to talk about my PhD and my experiences with that as well as my dissertation, which you can see here. So I think that's a really good idea. So that's what I'm going to do. So I'm sure that a lot of you are preparing for various types of exams in computer science and wanting to go to graduate school of some kind. And um, some of you might be interested in doing research. I hope some of you are. Um, and if you have uh, some amount of re uh, interest in research, then this video may be useful to you. If you have any questions about uh, what PhD life is like, uh, what types of things you want to go into, is there anything anything that you're doubtful of, where do you want to apply, how does the application process start, um, when, you are, when you're done with your PhD, what do you want to do, and uh, any types of those questions, uh, p please put them in the comments below and I'll, I'll be happy to answer all of them. Um, because my uh, situation is unique. Um, actually, it's really different than everyone else's. But um, So I've been extraordinarily lucky throughout my PhD and actually more post-PhD than, uh, than during it. But uh, yeah, there are some things that I have shared that I'm that I've experienced that you um, will probably experience as a PhD student. So, um, so, so let's just start from the beginning. So what is a PhD? A PhD is a terminal degree in some sense. It's the, uh, the highest degree that you can get in a particular subject, pretty much, um, especially in computer science. So what do you usually do in a PhD? What you usually do um, and this depends on the university, and in fact, my university is different than everyone else's in some sense. What you usually do is you write uh, a document like this. Ooh, I didn't mean to do that. A document like this. And what is it? It's called a dissertation. So this thing is called a dissertation or thesis. It, it's one of those two. And what it is is a culmination of your work the research work during your PhD. I did an undergraduate thesis, but um, that was not required. Well, it was required because I was an honor student, but um, a dissertation is required, I think, everywhere for a PhD. So if you want to do a PhD, you got to do one of these. And what is it? So, and there are some requirements for doing a PhD uh, other than this. So some universities may require you to take a bunch of classes, which I had to do. Some universities will require you, in fact, most universities uh, require you to publish some articles either in a journal or a conference or both. And that's what I did and because I had to do it. And, um, well, and I wanted to do it, but it's something I had to do. Um, and in computer science specifically, the dissertation here is often considered a cut and paste type thing for a dissertation, which means that you what some people do is they literally copy and paste their published research articles as chapters into this dissertation. And, um, and that's how they usually make it. That's not true of every discipline. Um, some disciplines are different. Okay. Yeah, so you can see here, dissertation presented a partial fulfillment of the requirements, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so um, so how does this process work? So you usually approach some advisor. So you have to have an advisor, someone who's going to help you along during the research process. And sometimes they're collaborators, sometimes they're not. Um, what they do is you they present you with a topic or like a general area that you may want to go into, you start looking into it, and then you try to find specific problems that you are interested in. And there are some specific um, things associated with these things called hash families, which I'll talk about in a bit, but, um, and, and these things called T restrictions, but oh, it's not really that important. The, what's important is that 
I had to find a specific problem that I wanted to work on or specific problems mm -hmm. I wanted to work on, and that's what I did. Um, so what else do you do? So in my particular in my particular case at my university, what I had to do was you have to pass a comprehensive exam, which means for um, at at least at my university. Um, you, you can you can find out what it is. I won't say which one, but you can find out what it is. Um, what you had to do was you had to form a committee. So that's consisting of your advisor uh, as the lead of the exam committee, and then uh, and then some uh, other people that you form in your committee. And what you have to do is that they send you questions to answer. Um, usually about your research area or um, or just about uh, general problems in computer science or the field that you're interested in. And then they then you send answers back and then that's the written component and there's an oral component too where they will you'll be in a meeting with them and then they uh, ask you specific questions. Um, maybe like follow-up questions to what you sent in as written answers. And if you pass, great. Um, well, most people pass those, but sometimes they fail and sometimes you'll have to uh, like try again and et cetera. But most people pass that. So you have to have a uh, comprehensive exam, sometimes abbreviated as COMICAM. Okay, so then what do you do after that? What you, t what you do after that is you write something called a prospectus. And what is this? This is basically, and this varies depending on discipline and university, but it usually is a document that you write that tells you, uh, that, that tells the committee that you have done some preliminary work in this research, and here are some of your initial results. What's your game plan after this? So, and then what you do after that is you further your results you hopefully publish things, and you write the dissertation, which is this thing, obviously. So that's usually, th so these three things right here is the order in which you will do things in a PhD. And that usually takes place over four to five years, um, sometimes more, sometimes less, uh, but around four to five is the average. And in fact, I did Four, it would have been four, but for complicated reasons, I had to push it back that were outside of my control. But it, it, it's around four to five years. Okay, so uh, in addition, so uh, I'll put here like a zero requirement. Um, you sometimes have to do a certain amount of classwork. And in fact, in the university I was at, you had to do a, a lot of classwork. <laughs> but yeah, um, classwork is sometimes required, sometimes it's forbidden. Some universities don't allow you to do classwork because the real goal of a PhD is to do research. So the question I get all the time is, in, I'm interested in research, should I do a PhD? So, um, so what are the goals of a PhD? So why would you ever want to do such a thing? Why would you want to under, undertake four to five years of um, study in a particular subject and not be paid very much. So note here, you're not paid very much to be a PhD student. Nowhere pays very good. So what are the goals? The, the only one that I can really think of is, is an academic job of some kind. If you don't want an academic job, don't get a PhD. It's not worth it. If, even if you have a little bit of a doubt that you want to do uh, get an academic job, don't do it. <laughs> it's not worth it. it. But if you really want to get an academic job, it's very fulfilling. Uh, I'll assure you, it's very fulfilling. But the problem is that there are so many PhDs and so few academic jobs available. Okay. Um, in fact, I had to send like a hundred applications and I get like one response saying that they want an interview. Okay. Luckily, they offered a, a good job, but uh, so that's one of the reasons why I'm extremely lucky, but that's just something to keep in mind. 
that if you don't want an academic job, don't get a PhD. It's You don't get paid more at most places. In fact, there are some um, software companies that will turn away PhDs because they are overqualified. Although that's not completely true. Like Google, Facebook, and like Apple and those types of huge places will love PhDs, but most places um, frown on the fact that it's a PhD because um, software companies are usually wanting more industry-led people, not academic people, because it's, it's a different environment. Academics and industry are different, obviously. So it's pretty much only to get an academic job. But if you want to get an academic job, you have to get a PhD, pretty much. There's no university that I know of where you can be a professor and not have a PhD now. Okay, so if you want to be a professor, you have to get a PhD. That's um, that, that's pretty much required. Okay, is there anything else that I want to say? Um, not really. So th this these are the things associated with PhD. Okay, so uh, so what did I do here? So so he here's the layout of the document. Um, so you have to write something called an abstract. If you don't know what that is, it's basically just a summary. And in this case, it's like a, a little over a page. So um, each of these paragraphs is uh, corresponding to us um, a particular chapter in the dissertation. So um, what you usually do is uh, you write an intro here to the whole to the subject as a whole or to the problems that you're interested in. Um, this is the first research chapter, and I'm going to abbreviate that as RC. RC is a research chapter. Um, then you have a second one, and then a third one, usually. Okay, and, and this one just happened to go to the end. But yeah, so... Um, at most places, you will have three chapters of research, usually for three different problems that you're working on. Of, of course, some people do more. Um, sometimes uh, fewer are done, depending on how in-depth things are done and what the quality of the results are, but usually three is a, a good number. Okay, then uh, you write acknowledgments. So the acknowledgments here are for um, thanking all the people that you that helped you during your PhD. So this is so you, you can you're free to write whatever you want pretty much in there. Then you write a table of contents. Well, what so you may be thinking, well, uh, did you actually write all of this stuff right here? Um, all of this uh, pages and all these terms, right? So if you use LaTeX, so uh, written like this. So if you use this, then your life becomes much simpler. If you want to write a dissertation, this is the way to go. Um, because it makes everything look nice. It organizes everything for you. It's a godsend. You don't have to write bibliographies yourself. It just does everything for you, which is really nice. Okay, so then there's all that, blah, blah, blah. Then you have certain lists, like lists of tables all the tables that you do, all the figures. And, and LaTeX does, uh, creates all of these for you, so you don't have to manage this yourself, which is really nice. Uh, in, my, in the university where I was from, you have to write a glossary, which um, I actually, you, you actually do have to do this yourself, um, which is kind of annoying, but it's just the requirement. Various notations, so some people may not be uh, aware of what this terminology means, so it's just a little refresher if someone is knee-deep into reading your dissertation and has to come back to understand what some term means. And th This is really nice for them to be able to refresh themselves on. Okay, so then you write an introduction. So the introduction here is just a general overview of the subject without any technical stuff. So no technical stuff. 
Nothing technical goes in here, pretty much. Um, unless it's absolutely necessary, but um, no tech stuff here. So what was the problem that I'm interested in? I, I do have a lot of text here, but um, my interest is in uh, software testing in some sense. So I'm interested in the mathematics of software testing and the theory behind it, as you might know by the channel. Um, so what is this right here? So this is a what is called a test uh, suite, this whole thing right here. And so what, what is its uh, purpose? Why do we have this here? So we have uh, four components right here. So we have four components right here, which are the browser, the operating system, the connection, and the printer. So it's basically a bunch of components that are doing things at the same time, uh, various services at the same time, and we want to test whether a particular configuration works. So we're looking at three different browsers right here, three different operating systems, um, three different connections of some kind, um, and network connections, I mean, and three different ways of connecting a printer. You, you could put more components onto here or more operating systems or more browsers. This is just a, an example. This is just an example. So what is this really doing right here? So if we look at this, there are three choices for each one of these right here. So the total number of possibilities then, so the total number of possibilities is, well, I have three choices for the browser. Again, you, you can choose more or fewer if you want. Three choices in this case, three operating system choices, three connection choices, three printer choices. So for that reason, there are three times three times three times three different choices of these components that I could theoretically do. So what I can do is I can have a test for each one of those possibilities and then see whether it works or not. So the total number of possibilities is 81 because it's 3 to the power of 4. So um, that tells us that uh, we could design a test suite with 81 tests, just list all of those possibilities out. But it, we want to actually test the interactions of these components. So it's unlikely that um, any choice of browser, operating system, and connection works. And then once I add the printer into the mix, then things screw up. It's more likely that if I choose a browser and any one of them works, but then I pair it with an operating system, then that causes something to go wrong. Okay, so what do we want to do here? We want to test interactions of at most a certain size. So here, what it really boils down to is we have a particular strength in this um, in, in this um, test suite. And what it's saying is that for because it's strength 2, then that means that I pick any two components, let's say browser and connection right here, and I got to make sure that all possible pairs in those two components appear in some test. So here, Safari LAN, Safari ISDN, Safari PPP, IE with those three, Chrome with those three. So indeed, all nine possibilities appear in these two columns uh, because that's three to the power two. Three to the power two is nine. And let's just say we check this one and this one. Well, you'll find that um, all nine appear here. They can appear more than once. That's fine. As long as they all appear, then that's good. Um, we can check this pair, we can check this pair, we can check this pair. We can check, if we check every possible pair and all of the, all of the nine things appear at least once, then we call this thing a covering array uh, of strength two. 
If I went to string 3, then I would need to check all choices of 3 components at the same time. So, um, and this covering array is optimal because, um, in say in this pair, we need 9 different uh, rows here um, because we have 9 pairs to see in these 2 components. Well, I can I claim I can achieve this with nine rows, so I need at least nine rows, and I can do it with nine rows. So nine rows is optimal, okay? Or at least that's what I can claim. Okay, so that's the essential object, and why would this be useful? So, but so, because suppose that Safari and Mac OS have some kind of fault, like Safari just doesn't work on Mac OS for some reason. Um, for whatever test we're doing. Then once I do this test right here, this test, then this, no matter what these two are over here, they're not gonna fix the problem because there's, there's a problem among these two only. So then this tells me that if I run this test, I'm gonna get some kind of error. And it, once I see that error, then I can go back and say, oh, well, this test caused the error, then now I can dive in and see what things caused the issue. Okay, so then you may be thinking, well, what if PPP was in the mix right here and was um, causing the fault too? So this is a problem among uh, testers. you got to be able to think, what is the size of the interactions here? Can you get away with two? Can you get away with three? Can you get away with four, etc.? So, and why are these useful? Because there was some empirical work done that showed that if you have these interaction sizes or the strength at most six, then you can empirically find the vast majority of bugs. With strength two, you get not as many bugs found. With three, you get more. Four, you get more. Five, more. And six, they found over 99.5% or something, some really high value. But then you may be also noting that with higher strength, you need more rows. Because if I went uh, change this thing up to strength three, I would need at least 27 rows because that's three to the power of three. Um, so, and if I went to strength four, I would need all 81 tests in this case, because there are only four components, okay? So it's basically trying to optimize the problem of how few rows I need to actually um, to generate this array. So that's not what I actually do in the thesis. I study this thing called a hash family. Now I'm doing research in covering array land more, but when I was doing the, uh, my PhD, this is the central object I was considering. And it's, the reason why you, can, uh, you want to consider a hash family is that it helps you make a covering array. So um, the object is really, really similar, um, but it's, the definition is slightly different, which allows the, the hash families to be way smaller and so we can do a lot more computation with them, and uh, therefore we can optimize the covering array parameters better. But anyway, um, so here I uh, have a lot of mathy stuff, obviously to intimidate the reader. It's that's the only purpose among it. In in fact, um, if you're reading this dissertation, just skip this because it's just not necessary. Um, I, I give a better definition here. So what I um, always say is that the best definition of a math thing is a picture of an example of one. So this is a, what is called a perfect hash family, or PHF. So what is it? So again, we have something similar to a covering array. So, uh, but I'll just introduce it this way. So the six right here, we have six rows right here. The 12 here means 12 columns. So that's e pretty easy to see. The three here means that there are three different values in every single row right here. 
Okay, so we can actually, or at most three values, I should say. But in this particular case, you actually do need at least three. So there are always three values. So 0, 1, and 2. 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, and the same for the other ones. Okay. This final three right here is the interesting one. So this three uh, relates to this these three arrows right here. So that three says, pick any three columns that you want, any three that you want, then look down the, the rows in these three columns. The columns don't have to be consecutive. They can be anywhere. So here, what do you look for? You look for any row that has three different values in the row. So if we look at this row right here, we see 0, 1, 1. There's a one duplicated, so therefore um, we uh, say we we don't care about that row. As long as some row has all three uh, has three different values in any order, it doesn't matter. Then um, then that's good. So this row doesn't count. This row doesn't count. This one has a repeated one. This one has a repeated one. This one has a repeated two. But then we see in this last row that uh, I have two zero one which is three different values, okay? And if you check any other three choices of columns, you will find um, uh, three different values. So in fact, in, in the first three, you'll find them quite a bit. So the first row has three different, three different, three different, three different. So the first three columns, that triple of columns, is what is called separated four times. Because separated just means that it has three different values here. That's all it means. Um, and it doesn't matter that it's separated more than once. It just matters that it's separated at least once. That's all that matters. And what does at least once mean? That's what that one is right there. So the one in the subscript means that it's separated at least once in every choice of three columns. And if you actually look at the... Um, uh, how covering arrays and PHFs are related, you can actually make covering arrays using PHFs in some sense. Um, and why is that? Well, the three different values in, in a particular row correspond to three different columns of a covering array. So in the covering array, what you do, let's just say it has three columns in the covering array, you replace the zero by the first column in the covering array, first column, the one by the second column, and the two by the third column. So the covering array with three columns has, um, has all triples covered, let's say. Then right here, if I cu uh, cut and paste the zero, one, and the two, to be the columns of the covering array, well, these three correspond to three different columns of the covering array, which means that uh, in these three columns, all the triples will be covered. But now I can get 12 columns out of it instead of three. The, the penalty is that now I have six times as many rows as I did before. So whatever the number of rows the covering array had before, now I have six times as many, but I have more columns. So there's an interplay between the number of columns and the uh, number of rows um, here. There are some other objects here that um, are just variations of, of hash families and covering arrays and whatnot, but that's not that important. The thing that I'm studying right now is, I don't want to make this video too long, but is something called higher index. So the idea here is that instead of just covering or separating everything once, at least once, I separate or cover them a certain number of times. Let's just say lambda times. So if lambda is five, then everything has to be covered or separated at least five times. Um, and that's obviously going to require more rows than the one case, but it's in the in the general case, but it's just wondering how many more rows do I actually need? Well, what I could do is I can just take, let's just say a covering array, 
and I can vertically juxtapose the same covering array over and over and over lambda times. And the, the much taller array now will cover everything lambda times at least. And so that's clearly a way to get to hash families of higher index. Um, uh, sorry, covering arrays of higher index. But, and we can do the same thing with perfect hash families too, so it's no different. But it's just wondering, can we actually do better than this? And it turns out in the vast majority of cases, we can. There are some cases where we actually can't do better than this, but there are cases where we can actually do significantly better. And by, so if the covering array had n rows before, then this thing obviously has n times lambda rows. Then, but what we can show is that the optimal answer is um, at most, because it's not quite settled yet, um, oh, what is it? It is, um, it, it would be n plus, um, yeah, lambda times log log k where k here is the number of columns, okay? So, um, is that right? I'm trying to remember if that was right. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, I, I, I'm squashing a few things here to make things easy, but the thing to notice here is that the lambda is being a plus here and um, being multiplied here. And note that in the optimal case, n is about log k. So this thing is really like log k plus lambda times log log k. So um, instead of being attached to a log k, it's attached to a log log k, which is a lot better. Um, but this is not proven optimal. <laughs> um, in fact, there's quite a difference between the lower and the upper bound. But um, yeah, anyway. So uh, we, I do a bunch of math stuff, a bunch of little constructions for things. Uh, so that's not as important. There is a new technique that I, I developed where uh, we can get a lot more columns than the original um, and a, recurs a technique to actually generate those. So that's not that important. Um, I actually <laughs> um, made a reference to Tenacious D right here. Um, I'll put in the comments if you can recognize that. Um, yeah, so then there's a really um, interesting expression that I was able to, to find here. So it, it looks absolutely horrible, but the idea is really good in, in terms of like, it's actually a really simple idea, but it's just hard to, to write in uh, mathematical language. And that's something that you should... Um, take into consideration whenever you're writing writing anything is what is your audience so um, I'm writing for academics here because really only academics would read this so I'm writing in an academic way but the thing is if you're writing for uh, the lay person <laughs> don't do this okay um, just just write in English if you're writing to someone who has no idea what two plus three is, okay? So try to write things um, that make sense, okay, for, for the audience that you're considering. So then I do some work with um, satisfiability, which means that I, I create a little formula and I check whether it's satisfiable or not. If you happen to know what conjunctive normal form is and whatnot, uh, that's good. That's, that's basically what I'm doing there, and I'm, I'm still doing work in that. Um, then I do a bunch of stuff with that, and I, I prove various things, um, and be, because this hasn't been done. So a, a lot of the things done in PhDs, um, the work itself is usually not very, not that good, honestly, but the thing is that uh, a lot of the time a PhD is either extending a result that has already been done or doing something that has never been done before. In this particular case uh, for the formula stuff, it's just never been done before for this object. So that, that's why, why I did it. Um, 
So uh, the, the really cool thing is that I can improve some of the bounds that I found uh, using the satisfiability formula. So usually the satisfiability formula is to tell you whether something is uh, whether this covering array, for example, exists or not. That's that's the whole purpose of it. I use that to help me get a um, uh, a new bound on um, how big I can make PHFs or how small, I guess. Um, and that's actually a new technique that hasn't been tried before. And um, I wasn't able to get really far with this um, because there's not really much you can do otherwise that I can see, but it's actually a, a really, really cool idea. So then I make some tables and whatnot. Um, so then I do some probabilistic methods, which basically are asking when does a covering array or PHF actually exist. Um, so I do a bunch of work with that. Then I create a an algorithm to actually, oh, where is it? Yeah, so I create an algorithm to, oh, where is it? Yeah, so I create an algorithm to actually generate these, these hash families that meet the bounds I was able to find, that actually generate the array, which is really cool. And it's actually a new technique that hasn't been tried, which is, uh, really good, and we're doing some work in that too. Um, so I prove some things. Um, so then I make this really nice, uh, although really s simple figure. Um, there are actually two bounds. I showed you one er at the very top. Um, there, are, there are actually two bounds, the red and the blue line. It's just that sometimes one bound is better than the other, but the algorithm, which is the black line, obeys both of them. Um, if you dive into the details, it, you can show that it obeys both. And so it's below them. So it's at least as good as the bounds for sure, but it often might be better. Um, so I do some computational results, and we can see the logarithmic uh, nature of these. So um, lambda equal 1 is down here, then 2, 3, 4, and 5, which is uh, what you would expect. So you can notice that So this one ends at like... I can't see, like 45 maybe? I'm not sure. Um, so the naive approach would be to have the lambda equal 5 one to be 225, but you can see here it's like 90. So that's significantly better than the, the naive approach because we have a lot of columns. We can, we can see down here that, oh, uh, uh, not really see, but down here, is um, it really is like twice as big, three times as big, four times as big, five times as big uh, down here. But once you get down here over to more columns, then the the diff the absolute no sorry the relative difference goes down. So you can see that it's only like twice as big down here, whereas it was five times as big down here. And that relative difference is going to shrink and shrink and shrink um, the more columns you add. Okay, that's probably too many details. So then I do a bunch of computational results in here. Um, yeah, so then I did a different experiment that didn't really go anywhere, that just um, gave inconclusive results, um, which may mer merit further study. But Okay, then here's the second chapter, which was published. Um, so it, it's basically just a math chapter, and it's just asking... Um, when a certain type of hash family exists. So these things are called fractal hash families for uh, a very good reason they're called that, but it's just asking when when they exist. And it, we give a bunch of constructions on how to actually make them, which extended a previous method, and it improves a lot of covering array sizes, which I won't really go into. Um, okay, so, so what else do I have? So then this one was published, and in fact, um, uh, this year I published um, at the genetic, at the Gecko conference, Genetic El Evolution and something, something, something. It was going to be in Cancun, but coronavirus ruined that. <laughs> Thanks, coronavirus. I, I, I could have went to Cancun, but I can't. Um, so uh, what is this? It looks like an... It's an awesome title. I love this title. 
um, uh, existential restrictions. That it's, it's, it's a really really cool title. I love it. But um, it, it's kind of dull what it actually is, but it's just a really cool idea of using genetic algorithms in a new way. So if you don't know what a genetic algorithm is, I'll give you um, a little bit of insight. So the idea is that you have a population. Let's just think. Let's just think people. We have a population of people right now, and we want them to be a f and they're isolated in some sense. So they they don't have contact with the outside world. They're just by themselves. What we want to do is we want to make those individuals as fit as possible. Um, which may may not have ethical implications, but th this is just the scenario that sets this up. So the idea is that we're going to breed individuals of this population together and just see what we get. Then what we do is the, you know, that old phrase, survival of the fittest, only the fittest people in our population survive. And so what you do is you have the fittest population be the next set of individuals to go again to breed. And then we get some individuals, and we only keep the fittest ones, and then just keep repeating over and over and over. A genetic algorithm is very similar. So the idea is we have a population of, say, an object, like a covering array or whatever, and we're going to breed them together and mutate them, because whenever you breed, sometimes there's mutations that occur. But we breed them together, and... Uh, what you just see what you get, and you keep the fittest ones um, for the next population. Um, so for fittest, fittest in this case means that they cover a lot of interactions or do a lot of separation for the perfect hash family case. But um, there's some kind of fitness associated with each individual. And a few decades ago, there was some work on um, on genetic algorithms for this purpose, for covering arrays and perfect hash family, not, not PHS, but for covering arrays. And it was pretty shown conclu conclusively that genetic algorithms are just not that good for this purpose. So there are other techniques like simulated annealing. If you have questions about any of these terms, put them in the comments. But there are certain um, other techniques that are faster or better in some sense. And uh, no one really looked at genetic algorithms, but what I do here is I use them in a completely different way. So if the size of the domain of, of what a covering array could be is really big. So for each of the entries, there's a lot of different possibilities. So for the whole array, there's a gigantic number of possible arrays that we can have. So the domain is absolutely massive, and there's a lot of symmetry in that. Um, in that domain that is not really exploited. What we do here is we drastically reduce the size of the domain, and I'll show you what that means in a second. Um, and genetic algorithms are really good at ex exploring domains that are really that are not that big. If they're massive, they they they're just not that good. But if they're relatively small, then they're actually really good. So. Uh, and that's basically what it is. So, uh, do I have a picture? I, do I have a picture? Oh, maybe I don't. So, I have the algorithm here, but I, uh, it's better with a picture. So, let's just say that we have a, um, a perfect hash family, which is what I do here. But it, it doesn't really matter what it is. It's just that I have something. What I'm going to do is I'm going to horizontally juxtapose it some number of times. So it's the same array throughout the entire thing. And that's actually a really good start because if you pick any set of columns just within any one of these, not crossing them, not crossing between them, then it's actually, it, co it separates every single one of those because it's just a copy of the original one. And actually, if you have some choices of columns that go across the copies but correspond to distinct columns in the original ones, then that actually works. That also works too because they correspond to distinct columns of the original, and so it must separate those two. The only uh, ones that are that we need to fix 
are the ones that correspond to duplicate columns. So like this red one corresponds to say this first one right here. So if you have two columns that are the same, then they don't have different values and so it can't be separated. So um, what, is, what is this really doing here? What it's doing is um, the individual is applying a transformation to each of the rows right here. So let's just say this row is going to be transformed in some sense into a row for this guy. And then uh, I'm skipping over a few details, but it's uh, transformed into a maybe different row for this one. And what I do here is what is called an affine transformation, which means I add a certain number onto each of the things in the row and reduce it modulo some other number. And because of if I have a row and I add a certain number to them, then each of the interact uh, of the columns that are that are separated just within each copy, they're still separated because it's only on a row by row basis. Um, it and then across them is when things might uh, cause issues. But the what I was able to see empirically is that this drastically reduces the size of the number of um, sets of columns that are not separated by this thing. And by reducing this number, then what I can do is add fewer rows at the end to separate the other ones. So that's essentially the idea. And the genetic algorithm is basically the transformation, and the size of the transformation is way less than the size of the whole array, which is really nice. Um, yeah, so that's basically the idea. Um, then I do some other ideas here. Um, and then my, the article I published this year is, um, is the same but different. <laughs> it's the same idea but in a different context for a different uh, problem. Um, and I can talk about that at some point, but um, it's outside the scope of this. Then what you do is you write a conclusions uh, chapter, which is um, basically just summing up what you did in the dissertation. I, I, di I didn't do this until the very end, by the way. So it's not like I planned the intro and the conclusion. Those are actually written last, believe it or not. Then you include future research directions because no research is ever done, right? That's why it's called research. And then I put a bunch of things that um, would be worth looking at uh, for future research. I'm not sure if anyone's working on this, but yeah. So I think that's a good place to stop here. So uh, thank you for sticking to the end if you're still here. Um, if Again, if you have any questions about the PhD or graduate school process or applying or anything like that, put them in the comments. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, if, you, if you want to support the channel, I'm actually now including a PayPal link in the video description. So um, if you want to donate via PayPal, that's a, uh, I, uh, you can do so at the link below, but you never have to. These will be made completely free, um, never under a paywall under any kind. So um, if you want to support the channel without contributing financially, just like and subscribe to the channel. It really uh, helps us out. Commenting really helps too. And as always, I'll see you next time.